one thing that's important to note is people will sometimes point to um, you know, the volume of transactions in different cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being the most obvious. But obviously what we're interested in is if if you want it to be a currency. We're not interested in uh, how many trades are made in that. We're interested in how many times it is used to actually buy goods and services. And, um, and, and that number has remained very low over time. I'm Mary Long, and that's James Sirwicky a regular contributor to The Atlantic, Fast Company, and author of the book, The Wisdom of Crowds. Back in July, David Gardner caught up with Sir Wiki on the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast. We're playing a piece of their conversation on today's episode. They discuss how the case for Bitcoin evolved and where its utility has fallen short, a question that investors should ask before purchasing any asset, and what drove meme stock bubbles. If you'd like to listen to the full episode, we've included a link in the show notes for you. Jim, welcome back to Rule Breaker Investing. Thanks for having me on, David. I'm just delighted to have you back. And as I said at the top of the intro, it was two years since you last appeared on this podcast. I am, to my slight credit, I I said we're gonna we're not gonna let three years pass before revisiting each other in this topic. And so I'm happy to say, uh, inside three years. We're back. But, Jim, a lot of things have happened in the world of cryptocurrency, which, <laughs> since it's a rather large world, I would say have happened in the world at large yes. these days. And I definitely want to touch some of those. But I want to start with where things were in February of 2021. The title of that podcast was Bitcoin 2021. My good friend Aaron Bush joining you and me. Bitcoin was sky high. That week, it touched over $50,000 per Bitcoin. Wow. Just to quickly trace these back. Now, I don't follow this actively. We have listeners who know this down pat, but I'm about to take us all briefly through the stock graph of Bitcoin since February of 2021. So $50,000, as you and I talked two and a half years ago, dropped to 35000 later that year, but was back up to 64400 all-time high, that November of 2021, you talk about volatility. Well, we'll spin it forward one year, 2022. Last year, it spent a lot of its time at or below $20,000. And as we started 2023, Bitcoin was trading right around $17,000 a Bitcoin. Today, mid-July, 29000 So you began writing about Bitcoin, Jim Sirwicky, in 2011. Even then, I think you said you thought it was in a bubble, but your January 21 piece you had just written for Marker two years ago said, measured as a currency, Bitcoin has failed. And you yes. probably raised some eyebrows, and you yeah, that's a good headline for a headline editor to get clicks. But Jim, what were you saying then, and do you still feel the same way today? Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel the same way. In fact, I, I think, and I, and I think in a way, the argument I was making in that piece, which is essentially that the original vision of Bitcoin, which was essentially that it was going to become a digital currency that could compete or in theory, I guess, uh, even replace uh, traditional, you know, what are now called fiat currencies, um, that, that that original vision was basically dead. Um, that the the nature of Bitcoin, um, both in terms of um, just literally technologically, that the fact that you know it could only do a certain a limited number of transactions uh, per hour, and I know all the Bitcoin evangelists will tell me that there are various ways they have been working on that problem, but um, but it remains a, a real issue. But then I think the second thing, which is um, a bigger problem, and is really inherent. In the way Bitcoin itself, it's not true of all cryptocurrencies, but Bitcoin is set up, um, is just that because Bitcoin has a limited and that is to say permanently limited number of Bitcoins that will ever exist in the world, uh, it basically creates an incredible incentive for people who believe in Bitcoin to hold on to it rather than to use it. Um, because it essentially means that the you assume the value will rise over time if more people want to want want Bitcoin, and so using it to buy a pizza, which is you know the famous example, was someone used it to buy a pizza <laughs> way many many years ago, and I can't remember how how much 
he would have now if he hadn't done that. It was the most expensive pizza purchase probably in the history of the world. Um, and so I, I do think that. So, you know, the argument that I was making was that, uh, which I think is now a fairly familiar one, is that Bitcoin really was now functioning more like uh, digital gold um, and that it was really serving more as a kind of, to the extent that it had any value as a currency, it was really more as a store of value. Um, it was really an asset rather than a, a currency, which you basically want people to be using. Um, and and that argument, I think, is essentially correct. And and you know, you will still hear people trying to make an argument that Bitcoin will someday be a real currency. But I feel like that's kind of um, faded away. And Jim, would you say the same thing of any other cryptocurrency at this point? I mean, my assumption is that Bitcoin being the brand leader and the top dog over history would be the one that has the best shot of all currencies to be a so-called future fiat currency. Do you see anything else emerging in the ether or do you think this is just not a thing? Ether is the um, actually is the only other one that I think has simultaneously the brand name and then structurally could also actually in some ways probably work better as a currency because it doesn't have that limited number, permanent number. Um, Ethereum? Permanent, yeah, set on it basically. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, Ethereum is used now um, within uh, sort of the crypto ecosystem to fund certain kinds of projects and the like. But, but I don't think there's any real evidence that Ethereum is being used as a currency in day-to-day -day transactions. And, and, and one thing that's important to note is people will sometimes point to um, you know, the volume of transactions in different cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being the most obvious. But obviously what we're interested in is if, if you want it to be a currency. We're not interested in uh, how many trades are made in that. We're interested in how many times it is used to actually buy goods and services. and um, and, and that number has remained very low over time. Um, you know, the one thing it is still used to buy is drugs and other illicit, uh, to participate in other illicit transactions. And it definitely does still have some value um, there. But I think even there, it has um, paradoxically become uh, somewhat less valuable as people have realized that it's not as, um, even though it's putatively anonymous, it's actually not as it's in some ways more traceable than certain kinds of you know dollar transactions, huh. um, and so I think that's that's it. So uh, you know I basically view these cryptocurrencies as uh, very speculative assets, um, and and I think that that's the way they're essentially used in the you know kind of the world at large. Jim, uh, you pointed out last time we talked two years ago on this topic that Bitcoin over the previous decade had been the best performing asset class. Uh, and But also, and I quote, almost completely uncorrelated with most other assets. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering, in the couple of years since then, seeing sort of the market bounce back this year, like I'm talking about the overall stock market here, yeah. and, uh, and then Bitcoin bouncing back, kind of looking like it's correlated with the movements yes. of the market. Do you think that that's a change? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's actually one of the reasons why when I look at crypto, I, let me let me back up a second. The, the question I have always had about crypto is why would I <laughs> buy crypto versus buying an index fund or a rule break, uh, a, the rule breaker portfolio or whatever? Like, why would I do it? What is it that it gives me? So, the argument, um, uh, you know, and, and I'm not obviously the kind of person that's concerned about the government, I don't know, whatever, taking my money or whatever the things are that conspiratorial minded people worry about. Um, and and so the one plausible argument um, that you had in the in the 2010s was that Bitcoin was uncorrelated, right? That it was it gave you it wasn't even really a hedge exactly, but it, it essentially diversified your portfolio. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, over the last two years, uh, and it was probably even happening around the time we we were talking. Um, in fact, I think you could go back to 2020. 
uh, when you saw, you know, you had this, the stim, the stimmies, the stimulus payments that went to younger people who probably didn't need them. And so spent them on either meme stocks or cryptocurrency and, and the like, um, what you've really seen over the last two or three years is, to my mind, a very tight correlation between um, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies more generally, and then what's happening, not just in the stock market, but more specifically in the NASDAQ. And so I think when you look at crypto over the last couple of years, uh, what it actually looks like is just a tech stock with higher beta than the NASDAQ does basically. And, and, you know, the moves up and down just tend to be, to be bigger. Um, although I guess in 2023, not as big as a lot of the NASDAQ stocks have been. Um, and, and that again, to me, raises the question of why, why, why do I want to buy a, an asset whose value depends entirely on the opinion? Okay. Maybe not entirely, but almost entirely on sentiment. Um, rather than you know a stock that has actual cash flow that's going to drive valuation in the long run, um, and my answer, of course, is I don't really think there is a good reason to do it. Mm. Um, let me add one other point about this, which I think is is important, which is the other argument for Bitcoin historically was um, that it was a hedge against inflation, and so you know in theory, as inflation rose, the value of Bitcoin should rise as well. We didn't see that actually. In fact, what we saw was as inflation rose in 2021 and, and into 2022, um, the value of Bitcoin cratered. Um, and as interest rates rose, the value the, along with, with stocks. Um, and so that again just made me think like, well, what? So there's no, it's not actually even hedging in the way that you might think gold would or something like that. Really good points. Um, and we're talking about the stock market a little bit and why buy this versus that. And so let's broaden this because something else has become popular in the last couple of years. And I'm thinking of so-called meme stocks yes, yes. As, as we talk now. And this was already happening a little bit as we got into the start of 2021, but yeah. it's really become much more of a thing now. So um, I want to talk about two stocks, both of which we talked about two years ago. So you'll r recognize these, even if you're not spending a lot of time rolling up your sleeves doing individual stock research. And one of them is certainly MicroStrategy. Uh, Michael right. Saylor, the CEO of the company, who decided to take his sort of mobile software consulting company in an unusual direction when he began converting the company's assets from cash into Bitcoin, and then even went so far as to start raising money on the public markets simply to buy more Bitcoin. Now, this is a rule breaker stock of mine, one that I've bought and held for a long period of time because I liked the story of MicroStrategy pre-Bitcoin, and MicroStrategy for about 10 years bounced between $100 a share and $200 a share from 2010 to 2020. In 2021, ticker symbol MSTR briefly skyrocketed from below $200 to over $1,200 a share. It was back to $150 by the start of this year, 2023. I will note it's back to nearly $450 seven months later. Now, I'm not saying this is a straight up one to one proxy for Bitcoin, but if you look across the world of the entire stock market, I'm not sure there's any public company that is more correlated to Bitcoin itself. Uh, the market cap, by the way, $5.9 billion for the stock today. They own about $4.2 billion of Bitcoin. Is that true? I didn't realize that. So, that much, and, really? and part of the debate we were having, it wasn't really a debate, but the conversation with Aaron was, you know, why buy MicroStrategy? Why not just buy Bitcoin? You got us a few minutes ago into the why own any of these things. Like, what are we trying yeah. to do with our money? Do you have any additional thoughts about MicroStrategy? We're not even going to, going to FTX yet. Do you have any additional thoughts about MicroStrategy vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin? Uh, <laughs> I... I, I have MicroStrategy is the kind of stock that I look at and just have no idea what to do with, basically, um, uh, because Sailor Strategy seems, uh, you know, very eccentric to me. Um, and, you know, it's funny if you look on like Yahoo Finance, um, it has MicroStrategy's uh, EPS as 
negative $84 a share. Wow, so, it's earnings so per I, share. Okay. So, so I have no idea what, 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 what its actual earnings per share are. Right. But um, so, uh, so, you know, I look at that and I'm like, my, my, my concern with, um, I'm a very risk averse investor, much, much more risk averse than I, than I think is probably good, good for me. And, and my uh, concern when I look at Bitcoin or uh, meme stocks generally and or or micro or micro strategy specifically is um, that I just don't see what stops the stock from falling once it starts um, because uh, because you know the valuation of Bitcoin essentially depends like I said on public sentiment uh, insofar as microstrategy has to some degree hitched its business to Bitcoin's wagon uh, I have the same kinds of of anxieties about it. Um, but I do think that in some paradoxical way, I, I guess I could see the logic of actually buying a stock in a real public company rather than in, in Bitcoin, especially because MicroStrategy does have some business um, underneath it. Uh, but, you know, that ride from, I actually, I didn't realize it went as high as 1200. I thought it had peaked at like It was brief. But, it was brief. Yeah. <laughs> But that ride from you know twelve hundred to one fifty, and then tripling is or close to tripling this year. I it just makes me feel anxious just thinking about it. Basically, so. <laughs> well, this has been uh, an ongoing, I would say, constructive criticism that you've been leveling at this situation, which is that how can these things really, especially Bitcoin, how can they really be stores of value when they're this incredibly? Volatile. Now, volatile. gold has been volatile at different points, and especially if we imagine when humanity, I can't date this, I'm not sure we all know, but whenever humanity decided officially to start saying, yeah, gold, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, I'll trade you that for food. Whenever yeah. that officially happened, I bet gold was a volatile asset yes. class back then, and it remains so thousands of years later, but it nevertheless does, to my mind anyway, once again confirm how right you were, Jim. Uh, going back more than a decade, basically saying this is not a currency. This yeah. this might be a store of value, but and, and in fact, I remember Aaron saying on that podcast two years ago, and I quote: "I think that even if it has failed as a currency," said Aaron Bush, "it doesn't really matter. It doesn't necessarily need to have lots of utility in order to hold lots of value." In some ways, yeah. Aaron concluded that's the point. And yeah. quote: "It does remind me, Jim, and you were talking to this earlier a little bit that." In fact, that it's not spent on a regular basis makes it, in some senses, a better store of value. Uh, and yeah. so just sitting there in digital vaults uh, being speculated on, ironically, makes it more valuable than it for, were being used. At least that's how some people seem to think about it. Well, one, I think the other thing that's true is uh, there, there is obviously, to some degree, you know, thinking makes it so, right? If enough, if, if as with gold, if we collectively decide or enough people collectively decide that something is valuable and it will continue to be valuable, et cetera, at some point it, you know, becomes genuinely valuable. And, and the one thing I would say, which is really obvious, is that uh, the structure of Bitcoin, this, you know, limited number of coins will ever exist, um, does give it the fundamentals uh, that will allow it to essentially hold value over can can allow it to hold value over time because you don't have to worry about uh, more bitcoins being produced um, and so it does have that uh, and and while I you know and remain somewhat baffled that Bitcoin is one Bitcoin now costs thirty thousand um, dollars a coin uh, I am less baffled by Bitcoin than I am by the purely utterly speculative things like, you know, Shiba Inu or Doge or whatever, you know, the multiple other, as they call them, shit coins that are out there, basically. Uh, the fact that people are, bet well, I mean, I guess people bet on those like they bet, they go to the casino. Maybe it's, maybe that's the best analogy in some ways. And that leads us to the one other meme stock I wanted to talk about. And this is one a lot of people know, and that's GameStop. And GameStop yeah. is a company that I was a customer of for so many years. It was a stock recommendation of mine a long time ago, back in its golden age, back when I was buying new games at GameStop, the bricks and mortar stores, and then returning it to GameStop to get value back so someone else could buy the used copy. And GameStop, as the video game industry really became mainstream, whether it was sales of hardware or sales of software, I highly esteemed GameStop. 
However, it too got caught up in the craze. I think most of us know this. It wasn't the only one, AMC and others. Uh, it's a little bit of um, not just meme stock. Are, are meme stocks, Jim, a meme themselves for our age? And if they are, if you want to go there, would you would you put Bitcoin in there with them? And what conclusions are you starting to draw about how we're investing our money? Well, you know, I, the way I kind of think about it is that I, th there are clearly are connections between meme stocks and crypto. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of overlap. I think in the kinds of people that invest in them, um, uh, at least historically, uh, you saw you know the kind of the bouncing crypto, the huge bouncing crypto happened around somewhat roughly coterminous with um, the bounce in meme coin in meme stocks. Although you know meme stocks, it was up and down even in twenty in twenty twenty one. I think the thing that's been most interesting to me about it, um, and to me in some ways, the meme stock phenomenon has been if not more confusing or let's say disturbing than the Bitcoin thing, it, it seemed odder in a way. Um, the way I would put it is, you know, I come at investing and I think mainly because of the time I spent at the fool in the mid 1990s, um, I come at it in some ways from a very traditional point of view. Uh, and that is to say that the value of a company really should reflect the discounted free cash flow of that company in the future, you know, with some real option value attached to it in terms of other possibilities. But that that's basically what you're trying to do. That what you're really trying to think about is if I own this company, literally, if I own the entire company, how much cash would I be able to get out of this company over the in the future? And then how much am I willing to pay for it, you know, in order to get a, a reasonable return on on my investment? And 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 while that sounds kind of traditional, it obviously applies to all kinds of companies. And uh, as obviously the fool and rule breakers have demonstrated, you can use it to think about a whole range of companies, including ones where you know the future earnings are entirely on the come, where right now they have no earnings, whatever. And we've we've seen that with you know the tech companies that dominate today. Um, so so when you come at it from that perspective, that was the part of the meme stock frenzy that just was where it really did feel like a pure bubble, where it really did feel like people were buying these stocks, not because they thought these companies were going to be really valuable in the future. There was some rhetoric around GameStop, you know, that Ryan Cohen was going to transform it. And, and obviously even now it's at $23 a share, which I think is, I think it's low was around what, like six or something like that before the thing took off. So, you know, there, there's, they may very well have improved certain things about their underlying business. Um, but when you looked at the valuations at the peak, uh, you know, what it really felt like, and I think that this is, this is the part of it that feels symptomatic of a cultural moment. It felt like people were basically just saying value is entirely, uh, value of a stock is entirely in the eye of a beholder. And if the market says it's worth X, then it is really worth X. Uh, and I just found that and still find it as someone who thinks a lot about investing and valuation, I found it just um, a wrong and then also just really disconcerting and um, kind of amazed that uh, people were, you know, we're very familiar with bubbles, um, but this was something different from like, this was different from a bubble where, you know, other, everyone's buying it and it makes you kind of think, Okay, wait. You know what? Maybe they're seeing something I'm not, so I should just get on this train and and you know maybe and and maybe they're right. Maybe Cisco really is going to be worth 600 billion or whatever it was worth in in 20 in 2000. This felt more like yeah, we all kind of know it's not really going to be worth this. It's not worth this, but we are going to essentially make it worth this by collectively deciding it is and. Um, that was just like it was so wild to watch, um, and you know I wrote about it, and the the the, the backlash against stuff if you criticize this was incredible, uh, because you know if if it is all about what we believe, you don't want anyone to try to question what you believe because it can shake <laughs> the thing, and you know that's all the stuff on Wall Street bets about diamond hands and you know kind of urging everyone to stay strong. It was amazing to watch. I mean, incredible. It is amazing, and you're right, that that feeling of, well, I'm going to buy this thing 
I don't really know if it's worth this, anything close to this or not, but I have a near-term conviction. And by the way, it's always near-term. Can I give you one other example? I mean, the, the, the stock that I was really, that to me was the kind of extreme version of this was Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Where, especially toward the end, right? So Bed Bath & Beyond was one of these meme stocks and it it saw similar rises and falls. And, um, and that was a stock where for a short period of time, People were convinced that again, Ryan Cohen, who's this kind of the the, the sort of secret wizard behind of these these was uh, behind these stocks, that Ryan Cohen was going to transform Bed Bath and Beyond, and he was going to spin out the baby business, which people were saying was worth you know huge sums of money, billions of dollars. Uh, but you know, if you went to a Bed Bath and Beyond store just to do that old Peter Lynch thing, like if you went to a Bed Bath and Beyond store, you just realize like. There's nothing here. This is chaos. They don't know what they're, you know, basically this is a retailer that is no, has no longer has a real reason to exist and is just not doing any of the things you need a retailer to do. Um, and then if you looked at its balance sheet and its debts, it just seemed clear. Okay. It's, but it, that it was doomed essentially. Um, and even, but even when Ben Bath and Beyond would say things like, we're not sure we think we're not we're not sure we're going to be able to continue as a going concern. People would still find a reason to to buy, and um, that was what was amazing. You know, even as it fell down, you still had days where it would double or triple over the course of a day because it essentially became a kind of slightly more expensive version of a penny stock. As always, people on the program may have interests in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Mary Long. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow, fools. Fools.